Thank you so much, Sunshine, and uh, thank you all. I'm uh, really delighted to have the opportunity to uh, speak with you. So I'm Steve Adams. I direct the Climate Change Adaptation Program uh, at the Institute for Sustainable Communities. Um, we're a 25-year-old nonprofit headquartered in um, uh, Montpelier, uh, Vermont. Uh, we work globally. Um, uh, over the uh, uh, last uh, five or six years, we have focused almost entirely on uh, climate change issues, uh, sustainability um, being a, a primary um, uh, component of, of what we focus on. So um, th as we think about some of the challenges, we focus in large measure on urban areas. Um, uh, we are working on, uh, on cities and communities of all, all scales. And we, we are working uh, in, in large measure around a, a wide range of different projects at the regional scale around the country. And I want to talk to you just a little bit about um, what we're seeing, what we're, what's happening around the country at the, at the local government scale. And I would tell you that um, uh, uh, by way of background, much of what we do is direct engagement projects, and I'll talk more about that. But it's also about building the capacity of local government officials to be able to address uh, climate and sustainability challenges more broadly. So over the last uh, five or six years, uh, through our uh, Sustainable Communities Leadership Academy process, we've, uh, we've uh, engaged uh, over 380 teams um, from more than 500 communities around the United States, um, and that's over uh, 2,000 practitioners who have come through ISC. And, and you'll see kind of in the green shaded areas some very specific places where we're working uh, and where some of, some of the, the activity is, is happening. And I say just, you know, as, as coming to uh, from largely state and, and federal government, working at the local level over the last five years has been remarkably uh, enjoyable and quite, quite uh, pleasant, in fact, in that uh, over the last five years, the, the issue of climate change adaptation, and I came to the, to the nonprofit sector in, in large measure to work specifically on this issue, um, has really heated up. So in the late, uh, in, in just five, six years ago, you see... Um, a huge explosion uh, of, of folk who are focusing on, on climate change adaptation. So this is just a, an analysis done back in 2009 showing just print articles in the United States that actually use the terminology climate change adaptation. You see this grow right up. And my friend Susie Moser has, has, uh, has since updated this chart to be more, more current, and that trend continues. Um, um, but we're seeing uh, this sort of activity and this focus uh, begin, begin to, to happen. And in 2009, we, um, it, was, it was hard to find folk who described themselves as climate change adaptation practitioners. You know, within the, the policy community, someone who focused on adaptation was, was considered to be someone who was giving up on emission reduction opportunities, and they were looked at suspiciously. But now uh, the, the policy uh, uh, world has changed, and adaptation is becoming an increasingly important uh, component. So I really want to talk to you about kind of the policy context within which uh, things are happening in the United States, particularly at the local government level. And really to think back on adaptation, you really have to look, I think, the seminal event it happened in, in, in the current administration. Uh, when the Obama administration came into office, there was huge pent-up demand, obviously, to begin to address climate change issues, both in terms of the emission reduction side, but also in terms of the adaptation side. And the administration really faced a choice. They could either try to organize it and orchestrate something across the federal enterprise, or they could take the let a thousand flowers boom approach. And, and they chose the latter. They decided to uh, put a task force together, begin to understand the broad challenges, but in large measure let federal agencies go in terms of thinking about what they should be doing on climate change adaptation. And as a result, during the first term of the Obama administration, there was a lot of, of, of uh, interesting uh, experimental things that were happening, a lot of science and assessment work, um, a lot of very early um, work happening on federal properties. But in large measure, the feds have made a decision, and they're moving in this direction. They're going to take care of their own. They're going to focus on and lead adaptation initiatives for federal properties, so for, for military bases, for national forests, for national parks. They're lead, and they're responsible for that. But for everybody else, for states and localities, for the private sector, it's up to you. It's up to other decision makers outside of the federal enterprise. And their role then is to provide science, technical support, the, and, 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 and to some extent, and, and perhaps uh, of late, we've seen increasing kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, recapitalization of, of federal efforts in, in terms of providing financial support. 
but really the the policy uh, uh, framework I think was was remarkably well sp uh, spread uh, 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 forged during the the final task force report back to the president back in October of 2010 and I think you know for our, our perspective the most important insight there is that adaptation unlike climate change mitigation where you can set national pri uh, priorities you can move that forward Adaptation requires coordination across multiple sectors, scales, and levels of government because the impacts and the vulnerability, you've seen the San, the San Diego story, you've seen uh, New York, you've seen Sandy impacts, you've seen the Midwest. The, the wide degree of variability and range of the kinds of impacts are highly variable across the country. So this really does pre present this remarkably interesting policy challenge. So we are seeing you know, the key questions coming out. So if the feds are going to take care of their own but then provide technical assistance and science to everybody else, how do you localize and regionalize? You've got 50 states, you've got 3,000 counties, you've got 19,500 municipalities in the United States. You know, the, the federal agencies cannot provide that level of, of, of technical support on a one-on-one -on -one basis. If you're Chicago, New York, you get, you get put to the front of the line, but other, other, other municipalities don't necessarily. So what's the appropriate scale for working at individual municipalities? There's been a lot of work in that area, so, but disasters don't stop at the, at the city limits. Um, so what, how do you work together? And how do you get federal, state, and local agencies to work together in terms of the kind of challenges that they are? Chad just uh, uh, illustrated the idea perfectly in that the feds are responsible for national flood insurance programming, but the locals are responsible for land use. So in order to have effective climate policy, you have to thread federal, state, and local duties, powers, authorities in, in a coordinated fashion in order to address the, the climate uh, adaptation uh, challenges that you're looking at. You have to do that from a uh, climate mitigation or an emission reduction perspective as well. And then, you know, something that we noted across uh, many localities was that the, the kind of the effect of a, of a um, charismatic leader. Uh, a, a mayor in office often weeds on issues, but then the next administration that comes in perceives that as being something led by the last guy, and we're not keen to do this, so we're going to differentiate ourselves. So are there mechanisms that help to, um, to create um, longer term initiatives because climate change adaptation in many respects and emission reduction efforts are really decadal, if not centuries, efforts that we're going to have to begin to deal with. And we as a species are only just learning how to deal with a rapidly changing climatic uh, regime on, on, the, on the planet. So what we are seeing is a, lo a lot of activity at a lot of different scales of analysis across the country. So the kind of work that we've seen or is that local level, the, the agency, the, the uh, transit agency looking specifically at, at its emission reduction efforts or its efforts to reduce uh, its vulnerability. Uh, we've seen uh, cities just as a city enterprise, the, the services offered by a city just focusing on that. Uh, we've seen the kind of the city level, you know, the, the Chicago Climate Action Plan is a prime example. It's focusing specifically on the, the, the real estate that's inside the city limits. And then now we're seeing regional collaboratives that are working across scales. And Michelle talked about the San Diego Collaborative, and that's really one of, one of the uh, more exciting developments that we're seeing. So we're working with practitioners in a, in a lot of different areas. So uh, one case um, I would point you to is the Western Adaptation Alliance. Uh, so this is now 13 cities across the Intermountain West who have come together to try to accelerate their learning and their ability to, to address uh, climate change adaptation within their communities. So these are 13 cities, and if you, if you take out the rest of the Texas population and, and economy, this, they account for something like 25% of these states, and they also anchor about 75% of the uh, gross state product for these states as well. As a group of practitioners, these are city officials who are trying to understand what climate change adaptation looks like in an arid, semi-arid context as they looked around at the uh, applied body of practice of urban adaptation, from their perspective, it was all driven by uh, coastal impacts, sea level rise being the top of the agenda, or Hurricane Stan Sandy like storm impacts. And so for these communities, Phoenix perhaps being the exception, getting the monsoonal flow from the, the Mexican um, um, uh, hurricane that just came ashore, um, they are seeing a wide range of impacts. So obviously water, 
uh, is the prime driver, the component that's there. Wildfire is a major issue. Uh, but we're seeing, just in terms of the, the, the last three, four years that we've been working with these, uh, with these practitioners, a growing degree of sophistication in the way that they're really understanding all of their hazards and how these hazards focus are, are going to be uh, amplified by climate change over time. Um, so you see Boulder, who was three years ago very much focused on wildfire, now beginning to pivot and realize they need to think about wildfire and flooding. We had last year uh, in what was in some parts of the Front Range a 1,000 year rain event that created those, those floods. So another place we're working is in southeast Florida. Uh, so uh, uh, this is unlike a learning model, uh, a learning network that we saw in the Western Adaptation Alliance. This is a regional governance model. Uh, this is not unlike what uh, is happening in San Diego and, and I would say also other, other regional collaboratives in the Bay Area and uh, Metro Los Angeles and in the greater uh, Sacramento area uh, on the West Coast. Uh, but here you see um, uh, four counties representing um, a population of nearly six million people now. It's about a third of Florida's economy, uh, a third of Florida's emissions. Um, but you see four counties coming together to try to coordinate their activities at the regional scale on climate change issues, both adaptation and emission reduction efforts as well. So the recognition here is that within this, this four county region, you have 109 cities working and uh, it, it creates a, a policy coordination uh, a framework uh, across the four counties that's remarkably challenging. So you see kind of in the uh, pre-compact formation um, timeline, I call this the Tower of Babel slide. So you see different neighboring cities, counties, um, having different rates of relative sea level rise projections that they were planning against. These are cities that are right adjacent to each other. They're communicating this into the press. They're trying to tell reporters about this is what we think sea level rise is going to be. These, of course, these reporters are writing for newspapers that are not just consumed within individual county lines, but rather their regional publications. They're also, by the way, talking to state and, and uh, federal elected officials. They're members of Congress. They're members of the state legislature. And they're asking for specific uh, appropriations to come in and, and say these are the challenges that we're getting. Well, of course, those those districts extend across jurisdictional lines as well. So, from a from a pure communications and advocacy uh, perspective, this is this is a nightmare scenario. So, having formed the the regional climate change compact, uh, the four counties and many of the the 109 cities in the region have begun to coordinate their efforts. They've recognized in joining the compact that there's many issues that remain under city or county control, like you know, deciding how to reduce emissions in city hall. That's your deal. You should focus on that. But the things that really drive regional scale resilience and sustainability and emission reduction efforts need to be worked out on a regional scale. Because if you think about sea level rise, you think about one community beginning to harden its shoreline if it's not coordinated with the neighboring community, you can have remarkably bad outcomes there in terms of uh, changing coastal dynamics. So they committed to, in the regional compact, developing a, a, um, a regional climate action plan, doing all the joint analysis to support that, and um, coordinating their advocacy at the federal and the state level on an annual basis. And then thirdly, um, um, uh, hosting and holding uh, an annual uh, a regional summit every year to keep this on the agenda. So now they're in their, their fifth or sixth year. They've now completed a regional uh, climate action plan that has 110 recommendations, I believe. Um, they're, and they're, they're very uh, focused on uh, moving forward with the implementation. And as, as uh, Chad noted, I think the, um, you really do see sea level rise happening in South Florida. There's, you see in the historic settlement, you've had nine inches at Key West since settlement um, over the last century. And you now are seeing on the highest of high tides, so it'll be the second week of October, look for it, you'll see pictures coming out of South Florida. You'll see uh, the highest high tide pushing stormwater up through its seawater coming up through the stormwater drains that are all gravity fed out to sea. Okay. So, of course, uh, extreme weather, as you keep seeing, is driving these adaptations across the country, and they are. The local government, uh, at, and in many respects, state government, you know, the phone rings at City Hall, people act. And it's from a, someone who worked at the federal and state level, it's so much more refreshing not to have to worry about politics because you just get it done at the local level. 
So one area, Vermont, got hit by um, Tropical Storm Irene uh, a few years ago, three, three years ago now, I think. Uh, they spent a year in the recovery mode, and you have to focus on recovery, getting people back into two houses. Um, but then at the end of that year, they were ready to pivot, recognizing that the weather regime that they're accustomed to is changing dramatically. They wanted to think about, so from, re from recovery to resilience, what does resilience mean? So you're seeing adaptations that are happening as well. So this is a, another rain event in South Florida. You see you know, a, a lot of water falling in a short amount of time. This is just west of the Miami, Dade, uh, Miami International Airport in a place called Sweetwater. And the net result is that they're putting big stormwater pumps into the ground. And those are remarkably energy intensive, <laughs> but that's gonna move the water out. And so we begin to see the adaptations that are going forward, and these were in the works for some time before the Regional Climate Action Plan came online, you begin to see a, uh, a need to begin to think about adaptation and our emission reduction efforts. We obviously can't not think about the emission reduction side whenever we're moving these things forward. And then you see a case where um, a, an impact, so Sandy, before it hit New York, um, spent a lot of time stalled off the Florida coast. Um, and it eroded a, a stretch of beach in Fort Lauderdale. You know, this is the iconic beach of, you know, where the boys are, or it was filmed in the 50s. And uh, it completely washed the beach out and the, and the little sidewalk there. The reconstruction effort that is, that is now being led, and it, this was a coordination activity. It's a federal road through a city on a beach maintained by the county um, in which um, state dollars are also being applied and you have city transit running through. So the, the relationships of the compact fostered a remarkably efficient way to work together. And the net result is that the, inst the reinstallation, what they're doing to rebuild this area is building resilience. They're elevating the roadway. They're doing a big dune restoration project here. You see the, the metal plates that are being armored along the side of what will be the elevated roadway on the seaward side. And the uh, expensive homes on the other side have finally uh, decided that having dunes in front of their, their house is probably a good idea, even if it does result in a diminished view. So what we're seeing <coughs> across the, uh, the country at the local level is the growing role of federal agencies. So the administration, as Chad noted, has been moving forward with a lot of executive order activity. They're, they can't get anything through Congress, so the, the president's going to try to do as much as possible, and the agencies are stepping up. So we're seeing through the, the, the HUD Partnership for Sustainable Communities and now the resilience uh, activities, there's a, a billion dollars of post-Sandy money that didn't get sent, uh, get spent rather, and now it's being recompeted in a national resilient design competition uh, the, the national, the, through HUD, and that, that was just released within the last couple of, um, couple of uh, uh, days. Um, you see now the, the emergence of this kind of metro regional scale of governance where local communities Local jurisdictions in a metro regional area are starting to try to figure out ways to work together. Uh, and this has important implications for the economics of regions, uh, transportation of regions, um, and uh, uh, you know, the work in climate appears to be kind of driving greater regional governance across other issues. Um, you see a, a greater degree of integration um, where climate change adaptation, where I sit versus the sustainability side versus the regional uh, efforts to reduce emissions and then the hazard mitigation side, the folk who have traditionally done disaster stuff are all starting to try to work together and trying to parse our various jargon uh, so we can speak to each other. Um, uh, you see uh, new considerations of resilience. Resilience appears to be a buzzword now, the new black. Everyone's talking about resilience. Uh, you see broader conceptualizations of it. Rockefeller Foundation has got their 100 Resilient Cities campaign out there. They're thinking about big, broad resilience, so resilient to plague and resilience to economic you know, meltdown and resilience to climate impacts. And so they're trying to locate all of this in a broader framework of resilience. And they're testing out a specific governance model to make that happen in big cities. And then, uh, as Karen noted, the, the, the Chicago health event um, here, the heat wave event here in the mid-90s has really been the, the kind of the iconic event that has really driven notions between social resilience and the physical infrastructure stuff that we often think about, that we really need to think about how to build uh, resilience in terms of social interactions at, the, at, the, at that scale. So that's me, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.